Is it recording? Ooh. Awesome. Mr. Dan Fenneran, I just got through watching your talk and I thought it was phenomenal. How are you doing, sir? I'm very good, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, this I, I'm a bit of a late minute addition to the to the schedule. Um, so the last day and a half to get everything all put together, including demos and and some of the new stuff they've been working on has been pretty hectic to say the least. But um, yeah, I'm pretty happy with the results that I managed to get together in such a short period of time. Yeah, you definitely got. So for anyone listening, this was, um, I think Dan had 24, 48 hours notice to get this together. 20, 24. <laughs> 24, yeah. So, um, so there we go. So thank you very much for that. I want to help everyone. I mean, I know you covered some of it in the talk, but maybe instead of more like the technological history of the project, maybe you could just give us your history like of your interaction with Tinkerbell over the last, what is it, 18 months, 12 months? 12 months or so. Yeah, it's it's been, so, I mean, it's, it's almost like a weird thing, but I suppose like bare metal Kubernetes has been almost a bit of a weird kind of a passion project that I've been, that I've, I've fallen into to a certain degree. So, you know, prior to, to joining packet slash Equinix Metal, I was at, I was at Docker and then I was at Heptio where I was generally helping customers get um, Kubernetes on bare metal for a variety of different use cases. And it was regularly the same sort of thing. You know, we want a Kubernetes cluster that looks, smells, and behaves like it would do in the cloud. And I'm like, well, yeah, you know, I want a gold-plated G wagon, but that's not going to happen. You know, it just. <laughs> and so, you know, I basically I spent a lot of my time writing reams of script and trying to automate these things in order to make it work. And you know, kind of out of that, um, I had a few kind of projects that gained you know a bit of decent traction and things like that, but. Um, you know, kind of over time, I started speaking with, you know, kind of a few people at Packet and I was uh, kind of given a, a sneaky, sneaky peek into uh, uh, some software that they're about to release, which which was Tinkerbell. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, kind of it, it just made sense to me to, you know, kind of come and come and hack on, on Tinkerbell. So, um, yeah, packed my bags, jumped, jumped on board there. The packet rocket ship, as it were. <laughs> the packet rocket ship. So you, but you also had, and you just touched on that a little bit. Now, um, Cubevit is, you know, the, the the big one now. But there were a couple of other projects that you put together earlier that were trying to address this space. How did that come about, and how does that, how is that different or the same as what we're doing with Tinkerbell? Yeah, I. So I mean. The projects that I put together were just solely for kind of getting Kubernetes on to a uh, a bare metal server. Um, they were kind of uh, some, you know, in, in all honesty, some of the work that I did has basically been ported into not necessarily Tinkerbell, but some of the actions that Tinkerbell does and things like that, which has been it's been nice to, you know, some of the work that I wrote that nobody really cared about to suddenly kind of find a home where I. I, I like to think people are actually pretty excited about, um, especially some of the newer stuff that I've been kind of demoing. Um, but yeah, I mean, so um, Plunder was the original kind of project. And from Plunder, I, you know, was made aware of the Cluster API project, you know, kind of a few members of the the team are, are all over that. Jason to Tiberius, you know, kind of king of Cappy and, uh, and things like that. Um, but yeah, so I kind of went down the route of making a Cluster API provider uh, and that's where I started hitting upon kind of more issues, mainly all around high available Kubernetes clusters and load balancing and all of that sort of stuff. So, you know, kind of had one problem, came up with a solution-ish for that, and then found another problem and then came up with another solution-ish for that. And so, you know, kind of KubeVip was largely, the, the idea behind it was a quick and easy way to slot in a piece of software, which would have basically give you you know, kind of a highly available address that would move around within your Kubernetes cluster for your control plane. In the event that something broke, you know, we we would take care of moving things around right. and the end user was none the wiser. Um, and it's, you know, so the cluster API provider I for Plunder is largely dead because I haven't touched it in quite a long time. But I mean, it's been super nice to see KubeVip going into places like cluster API vSphere, um, and going into cluster API Tinkerbell. So, I mean, Jason 
implemented that in an afternoon. That's I'm yeah, I'm like super happy about the fact that scary. I, managed, <laughs> I, I managed to do something right in that it was so easy for him to just kind of slot it in and there we go. Highly available bare metal Kubernetes clusters with Tinkerbell. It does seem one of those areas right now. Like when I, I remember being early in Docker, like 13, 14, maybe. I don't know, somewhere around there. And somebody came up with Compose, which I think at the time was called Fig. Yes. And I just remember thinking, God damn it, why didn't I think of that? Like, it seems like there's a lot of low hanging fruit in this space right now, where with like a weekend of work, people can make really significant contributions like they used to be able to do back then. Whereas now for Kubernetes or something like that, most things are like multi month projects. I think that's mm. maybe why there's a lot of excitement about it. Is, it. is that right? Yeah, I mean, I. The, I get one of the things with Kubernetes is that largely most people seem to kind of consider it almost done uh, right. from an infrastructure perspective. Because most people, I think, uh, f- the majority of users basically will just go to AWS, throw a credit card at it, yeah, yeah, yeah. and get and get a get a Kubernetes cluster, um, which is great. On bare metal, though, you know, like what you what you maybe don't realize is that a lot of the functionality that you think is coming out of the box doesn't actually exist. So mm. when you get that magic cluster on Amazon or Azure and things like that, it's covered in Azure technologies, which provide the magic. <laughs> when you deploy it yourself on bare metal, you've only really got half the solution. Right. Um, you know, kind of the automation has not been there. The technologies to load balance and, and do networking. Storage. Largely and, doesn't yeah. come storage. Yeah, there's yeah. so many bits. So... To say it's kind of done, I think, is a bit of a misnomer. There are still a lot of areas, um, and there's a lot of abandoned projects out there that people, you know, spent a weekend on. It was great, and then they, I don't know, then decided that they're just going to have their club clusters in the cloud and never kind of soldiered on with it. So um, it happens, as is the nature of open source. So one of yes. the um, uh, one of the things you touched on briefly there, which kind of segues beautifully into my next point, is about adoption. Now I don't know how much we can say and how much we can't say, but especially with the cluster API work, it seems like a lot of what we'd call major software vendors are getting on board. I know that Cody Hill from the Google Anthos team is going to come and do a very interesting demo at our booth at KubeCon next week, uh, basically taking what we have plus what they have and going from zero to Anthos in, I don't know, minutes, I hope. Yeah, hopefully. Um, <laughs> like, what, what, else is, what else is out there that you're seeing that we could talk about? So, I mean, what I... Yeah, there are uh, what, what did we say? A lot of irons in the fire, um, but <laughs> harvesters won. I just remember, like they're yeah, doing Harvester. a bunch of work on this very publicly. Yeah, yeah they're being public about it. Uh, so EKS Anywhere, one of their um, fantastic now principal engineers. Uh, congratulations, Mika, on your promotion there. Um, he has been uh, man's a demon with like some of the stuff that he's been writing on Tinkerbell, and he's coming up with some great ideas to kind of replatform things. On top of the bonsoir, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, to replatform things on top of uh, the Kubernetes API and things like that, um, and yeah, so I mean, he's publicly mentioned that um, you know for EKS anywhere on bare metal um, with things like Cluster API and Cluster API Tinkerbell, it's almost just a natural fit because EKS anywhere is you know, going to almost be the same to a, to a degree as kind of cap T just with more EKS anywhere components that we right. need to deploy in there. So um, the work that Jason has been doing and others um, for Cluster API Tinkerbell, which he is going to be demoing at KubeCon this week. I have seen it. It is mind blowing um, to see bare metal clusters act, behave and just be as quick as you would get within you know, kind of public clouds and stuff like that is is mind boggling. And I'm super excited. So obviously I've got a bit of an inside sort of view on this, but it does seem that maybe what month are we in? We're in October. It seems like maybe March, April, people were like kicking the tires. And now I think everyone's just doing Tinkerbell. Like, is that is that right? And why do it, you think that happened? Yeah, so I mean we we had kind of like a crazy few months in the middle of the year where um i don't know like it was it was one of those things where what was it like doc brown when he hit his head on the toilet and came up with a flux capacitor <laughs> or whatever 
Um, you know, I, I hit my head. Uh, Gianluca hit his head. Jason hit his head. And we all just, you know, light bulbs popping all over the place um, amongst the, many other folks. And we, you know, we just, we, we went crazy. We were throwing out ideas and we came up with a bunch of new things. Um, and, you know, it, it the project just kind of suddenly kind of really suddenly grew some legs and grew some pace. And, you know, like we, we were having a lot of fun. We came up, we were still having a lot of fun, obviously, but we came up with a bunch of cool things. Um, we've just kind of continued that on as well. So, I mean, some of the stuff that I've written this week, which I've demoed in my talk, um, you know, kind of getting some of the deployments down. And, uh, and this, as I mentioned, uh, I tweeted about it a few days ago, but like, these aren't your kids' servers. These aren't Raspberry Pis. These are, these are big, loud, angry machines. And we're deploying on them in seconds, you know, in some cases, a few seconds, and then the OS is booting. And mm -hmm. it's, it's insane. It's like, you know, cloud, you know, your, your time is up. We're coming for you with this. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. No, no, I'm only joking. I love everybody in the public cloud. We, we, we love all the clouds too. So I'm going to, I'm just going to uh, wrap it up with one last bit, which is um, you spoke a little bit about, I mean, you foreshadowed the future in your talk. Is there anything else, you know, people, this is obviously something that's really moving right now. Like what should people be excited about outside of like super big servers, really quick deploy times? Like what else is coming up? I mean, I think for me, it's really going to be um, as the adoption grows and, you know, kind of already mentioned, two people have mentioned publicly that they're both contributing and looking to it. I think that growth is, um, is really going to kind of change things quite a lot. We're going to, start to see you know we've at the moment we uh the community at the moment are really focused on just getting the operating systems on there quite quickly uh, as we start to see platform builders um do end-to-end -end solutions because i mean i can show you an operating system boot really quickly which i think is quite cool but for everybody else it's like yeah but my application needs to run on there like mm -hmm. <laughs> this is great but I've, I've i've still got a load of work to do right um so as we start to enable more people to build on top of all that by exposing things through APIs and Terraform providers and all that sort of stuff, um, I think once we have the capability of enabling end users to maybe take it to platforms and applications and things like that, I think that's when you know it, it will it will grow even at an even faster rate, and we'll see you know click a button and bang here's my shop online and do all of that sort of stuff. So right. there's, there's a lot kind of going on there, which I'm very excited about. So I think we're at the top of the time here. Dan, I want to say a personal message, which has been one of my pleasures of my life working with you on this. Uh, and also thank you very much for supporting the Rejects conference with 24 hours notice today. <laughs> I know a lot of people are going to enjoy your talk, but for now, thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks to Microsoft Azure and Equinix Metal for supporting us at the champion level. We also want to thank Red Hat and Slim.ai for funding us at our supporter level.